Let me uh, welcome you to the annual uh, Wallace Stegner Lecture, which is the kickoff event uh, for the annual uh, Wallace Stegner uh, Symposium, uh, which is our 23rd uh, uh, symposium, annual symposium here at the Stegner Center. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Bob Keiter. Um, I'm uh, uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center, uh, and, and they tell me I'm uh, the dean for six months uh, at this point. Um, uh, but uh, we'll focus on the first uh, rather than the uh, rather than the second. Uh, the uh, annual symposium, uh, which is uh, flashed up on the screen uh, off and on, uh, addresses the topic of uh, public lands in a changing. West. Uh, the symposium occurs uh, tomorrow and Friday. Uh, brochures are available outside if you haven't uh, received one and would be interested in registering uh, for it. Uh, it goes all day uh, Thursday and most of the day uh, or through the noon hour on uh, Friday. Uh, covers a good uh, bit of ground uh, regarding uh, public lands, uh, the role that they play uh, in the West and the uh, evolution historical uh, scientific, uh, economic, and uh, otherwise, along with uh, some case studies of some uh, uh, regions and issues uh, that have provoked a, a good deal of controversy in recent years, uh, one of which is uh, the establishment and then the modification uh, of the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument here in the state of Utah. Um, I should also note that uh, our next uh, Stegner Center event, uh, part of our Green Bag series, is scheduled for March 29th over the noon hour in this room, uh, and it features uh, Andrew Gruber, who's the Executive Director of the Wasatch Front Regional Council, uh, who will address a topic that's of uh, great interest, I think, to all of us who live along the uh, Wasatch Front, of Wasatch Choice uh, 2050 Regional Vision. Uh, so please join us for that uh, uh, event. Uh, and speaking of the symposium, I should also note uh, uh, that uh, I gather uh, there was uh, some difficulty uh, parking today. Uh, we have uh, open and reserved uh, uh, the t uh, lot across the street by the football stadium. It's open parking for anyone attending the symposium uh, tomorrow without uh, need of a uh, permit. Um, let's see, uh, there's a sign-up sheet that we'll pass around. Uh, please uh, sign up uh, so we know uh, who's attending uh, our events and it also enables us to be sure to stay in contact with you about uh, future events. Uh, let me uh, now thank uh, the R. Harold uh, Burton Foundation and the Cultural Vision Fund, uh, which have uh, provided uh, the critical funding for this year's symposium and today's uh, Wall Stegner Lecture. Um, the R. Harold Burton Foundation is the founding uh, donor uh, for our symposium uh, and has supported us for all 23 years of uh, its uh, existence and it's critical to enable us to uh, bring uh, the caliber of programs that we've been able to uh, manage uh, through uh, the annual symposium. The Cultural Vision Fund uh, has provided uh, uh, consistent support uh, for the Stegner Center for any number of years, uh, both for our annual symposium, our Young Scholar Program, uh, and our lecture series, uh, and their support has been absolutely critical to our public uh, programming also, and we're deeply indebted to both uh, of our donors. Uh, John Leshy uh, is a distinguished professor emeritus, that's only recent, uh, at the University of California Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. Uh, before uh, joining the Hastings faculty, uh, he uh, sat in the unique uh, chair of serving as a solicitor, which is essentially the general counsel uh, of the Interior Department uh, throughout the eight years of the Clinton administration. He previously had served as special counsel to the House Natural Resources Committee as a law professor at Arizona State uh, uh, College of Law, uh, as an associate interior solicitor during the Carter administration, uh, 
Uh, he was with the Natural Resources Defense Council uh, for a while uh, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, and also early in his career served as a litigator at the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice, quite a varied and extensive uh, career. Uh, he's also helped lead the transition team for the two immediate past Democratic uh, administrations, has had a hand in shaping uh, public land policy uh, in uh, both of those uh, administrations. He's taught as a visiting professor at Harvard Law School, which is his undergraduate and law school uh, alma mater. Uh, he's published widely on the topics of public lands, water, and other natural resource issues. His books include uh, The Mining uh, Law, uh, and uh, uh, he and I have something in common. We've both written state constitution uh, books. He, the Arizona book, and I'll claim responsibility for the Wyoming uh, book. Uh, he's co-author of uh, Federal Public Land and Resources Law and Legal Control of uh, Water Resources in the West. Uh, and he's currently writing, uh, and quite relevant to his topic today, A Political History of America's Public Lands. He'll address uh, debunking the creation myths of America's public lands. Uh, please help me in welcoming uh, Professor John Leshy. Thank you, Bob. Bob is an old and Dear friend, uh, we've kind of watched our beards go from black to white over the years, uh, kind of uh, in parallel. That's comforting, at least to me. Uh, <coughs> I'm uh, delighted to be here uh, in this lovely building. I haven't been in this building before. Uh, Bob has done a wonderful job with the Segner Center over the years, and, and he's lined up a great conference. I hope people can stick around for it the next couple of days. Um, I could not uh, conceive of a uh, better occasion or a venue. Uh, for talking about uh, what I want to talk about today. Wallace Stegner, as I'm sure all, you, all of you know, was one of America's greatest communicators about the public lands and what they have meant to the nation. And Utah is currently where the most lively political discussions are found about their future. Uh, by the way, there is no standard definition of public lands, legal or otherwise. Um, I use it here to mean those lands that are owned by the United States, uh, that are generally open to the public and managed for broad public purposes. They're managed by four federal agencies. There you can get an idea of their sweep. Uh, four federal agencies uh, outlined in color here, the BLM, the Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and BLM. Uh, I'm sorry, Park Service. Uh, they carry many labels, parks, forests, wildlife refuges, monuments, wilderness areas, recreation areas, conservation areas, and so forth. I don't use them to mean military lands, submerged lands offshore, or lands held by the United States in trust for Indians. Now, when I first came to deal with the public lands uh, nearly a half century ago, I, like most Americans, really had no idea uh, that the U.S. owned about 30% of the nation's lands, more than 600 million acres. Uh, even more noteworthy, and these are the agency's land holdings, um, even more noteworthy is this, while some of those Vast, that vast acreage has been drilled and mined and dammed and logged and grazed by private interests. Their chief worth to the nation today uh, is first to offer experiences in nature uh, for recreation, inspiration, and scientific study, uh, and second, to protect watersheds, wildlife, and other natural values. Now, if you are like me, interested in politics and American history, you might wonder, how did this happen? How did the United States come to own and manage such vast land holdings for such broad purposes. Uh, it seems particularly noteworthy, considering that America's political culture has long extolled private property and regarded the government, particularly the national government, uh, with much wariness. Discussions of public lands often tend to focus on their rich history, and that's, of course, thoroughly intertwined in the, in the nation's history. In recent years, as Bob mentioned, I've been diving deeply into that history, and I've become convinced that many commonly accepted ideas about the history are, in a word, myths. They do not reflect what really happened. These myths have been influential, and not in a constructive way, in modern discussions of public land policy. Indeed, I think they have been a factor in the polarization that today uh, too often characterizes discussions about public land policy. The more they under, are understood to be myths, uh, 
the more productive, I believe, pu public discussions could be about the future of the public lands. And I hope to debunk some of these myths today. This task requires a very quick tour of, of nearly two and a half centuries of American history. So buckle up, hang on to your hat. While public lands are not a topic most Americans think much at all about, sometimes they do grab national attention, and we are in the midst of one such occasion now uh, because of President Trump's downsizing of the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments here in Utah, uh, and because of the armed takeover of a national wildlife refuge in Oregon a couple of years ago by a group led by a Nevada ranching family, the Bundys, who spouted claims that the United States has no constitutional right to own these lands, claims that have also been advanced by a team of lawyers hired by the state of Utah. Now, some look at this and say um, that such conflict and turmoil are part of a long tradition, that America's public lands, according to this view, have been a constant source of polarization, a kind of centrifugal force that, that drives Americans apart. That is the first myth I want to try to debunk today. The truth is, over the nation's long history, the public lands have nearly always served to un unify the country, not to divide it. That was demonstrated right at the very beginning of the country. In 1776, when the 13 colonies declared their independence from the British and set about creating a governing structure that would establish a national union of states. The founders' first attempt produced something called the Articles of Confederation, if you remember from grade school. Uh, it was the predecessor of the U.S. Constitution that came along a dozen years later. The Articles were drafted and sent to the 13 former colonies for their ratification almost immediately after the Declaration of Independence, within a couple of weeks. By their own terms, the Articles would not take effect until every one of the 13 former colonies ratified them. As historian Richard Morris has reminded us, the states became states only when the Articles of Confederation brought them into being, because it was the Federal Union that initiated their formation. It would, however, take almost five years to ratify the Articles, until 1781, shortly before the British surrendered uh, <clears throat> at Yorktown, which effectively ended the Revolutionary War. The aspiring nation, in other words, was operating without a formally constituted government almost the entire time it was fighting the Revolutionary War to establish its independence. The cause of this long delay? A dispute among the 13 colonies over claims to a vast amount of land, you can see on the map, dark, for the green, <coughs> uh, west of the crest of the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi. The colonial charters of seven of those 13 states to be defined their western boundaries in very vague terms, which gave them somewhat overlapping claims to all that land out there. Six states to be, Maryland, including Maryland, had fixed western boundaries. Naturally, they feared they would be dominated by the seven states that had all those land claims out there. Maryland refused to ratify the Articles of Confederation, holding up the formation of the government, until those seven with those western land claims agreed to yield them to the nation. The argument of Maryland and its allies was very simple. These Western lands, they said, were being secured by the Revolutionary War sacrifices of lives and resources, or as they put it, blood and treasure, of all the states. Those lands, therefore, they said, should be administered for the common benefit of the entire country. The only way to guarantee that, they said, was for the national government to take ownership and control their destiny. And that argument eventually won out. The seven colonies with the Western land claims agreed to cede them to the new national government. In return, Maryland ratified the Articles of Confederation, at which time all 13 former colonies became states in the new national union. In this way, the establishment of the public lands as an institution was foundational to the United States, to the nation. By these original land sessions, the United States came to own about 230 million acres, or nearly half of the real estate found within its borders at that time. Now, it fairly quickly became apparent the Articles of Confederation had some serious flaws, most notably in not giving the national government enough governing power. As a result, the Constitution was drafted in 1787 and ratified soon thereafter. As part of its strengthening of national authority, the, its so-called property clause was adopted without controversy 
and gave Congress authority to, quote, make all needful rules and regulations regarding the lands and other property belonging to the United States. Public lands would remain key as the nation expanded across the continent. The national government acquired ownership of land from foreign governments, beginning with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, and also resolved Native American title to these lands. As a result, the U.S. eventually came to own about one and a half billion acres of land. Now, how the U.S. acquired clear title to these lands from foreign governments and from the tribes is an important story, and especially where Indians are concerned, certainly one with a dark side. But it took place largely in advance and separate from, and is a different story politically and legally from the one I am addressing. Now, the second myth about public lands history is that the nation's founding generation expected that new states would, upon being admitted to the Union, become entitled to own the public lands the national government held within their borders. This myth is at the core of the argument of the Bundys and their fellow travelers and lawyers hired by the state of Utah. Not a shred of historical evidence supports it. What America's founding generation, including those who drafted and ratified the Constitution, did generally expect was that the Congress would adopt policies aimed at settling these Western lands <clears throat> with people friendly to the United States and eventually would admit them as new states. The immediate goal was, understandably, to keep the nation together as settlement advanced across the continent. Particularly in the nation's first few decades when national unity was fragile, but this was hardly a sure thing. But no one advanced the idea then that new states had some sort of claim, equitable or constitutional, to gain title to the public lands within their borders simply by virtue of being admitted to the Union. Indeed, the question was never raised in political discussions in or out of Congress until nearly a half century after the Declaration of Independence. In the late 1820s, a few politicians in some of the newer states, but significantly not in the territories aspiring to be states, offered arguments along that line. Their case fell on deaf ears. Leaders across the political spectrum, the likes of Henry Clay, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, John C. Calhoun, James Madison, one of the Constitution's primary authors, were absolutely opposed to the notion of ceding all public lands to newly admitted states. On the floor of the Congress, when it was brought up, the idea was roundly condemned in the strongest possible terms, members calling it preposterous, grasping, one of the most extravagant pretensions that could possibly be urged. Absolute heresy against the Constitution, against reason, against right. These are direct quotes from members of Congress. The harsh political reaction was perfectly understandable. Members of Congress were chosen by representatives of existing states. Simply ceding the public lands to the new states did not acknowledge that it was the blood and treasure of the existing states that was being expended and had been expended to acquire these lands from foreign governments and Indian tribes. Territorial interests seeking statehood were nearly always regarded basically as supplicants, ever more so as the nation grew stronger and its control of its territory more secure. Had aspiring states demanded title to, the new land, to all public lands, their greed would have fatally undermined their case for statehood, and everybody knew it. This political dynamic never changed over time. To drive the point home, Congress almost always required new states, including Utah, to agree by formal pledge not to interfere with U.S. control of public lands lying within its borders. Now, the third myth is that in the nation's first several decades, the public lands were viewed solely as an economic asset to be sold to generate money primarily to pay off revolutionary war debts. This is associated with a previous myth put forth to suggest that the founding generation had a limited vision of the role of public lands in building the nation. Again, the facts are to the contrary. From the beginning, Congress saw the public lands as far more than a cash cow. It saw them as a tool to care, carry out broad national policy objectives. Even in the nation's first few decades, tariffs gener generated far more money for the Treasury than public land sales ever did. Congress gave away many more public lands than it sold. More important, it attached import, uh, various conditions to its gifts of land in order to promote national policy objectives. For example, it gave most newly admitted states generous grants of public land 
<clears throat> on the condition that the land and income derived from them would be used to create a system of common schools, public education. This is a remarkably visionary step at a time when public education was unknown except for a few places in New England. These grants got larger over time. Originally, they comprised about 3% of a new state's area, but by the time Utah was admitted in 1896, the school land grants comprised almost one of every nine acres, about 11% of the state's, new state's land area. Similarly, starting in 1862, Congress gave all states, old and new, rights to some of the nation's public lands, on the condition that they be converted into an endowment to establish and sustain so-called land-grant colleges. This gift of public lands led to some of the nation's most important institutions of higher learning, MIT, Cornell, Rutgers, Purdue, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, UC Berkeley, here in Utah, Utah State, up in Logan. Congress also used grants of public lands <clears throat> to subsidize the building of transportation infrastructure, wagon roads, canals, railroads, highways, to knit the newer states to the old ones. Sure, there were disagreements over many of the details, but broadly speaking, Congress remained committed to the vision of carrying out, uh, committed to the vision of the nation's founders to use the public lands to foster orderly growth, prosperity, and most of all, unity as settlement expanded across the continent. Then as the nation's divide over slavery reached fever pitch and the Civil War loomed, the U.S. Supreme Court unexpectedly created doubt about the breadth of Congress's power under the property clause of the Constitution. Its infamous Dred Scott decision in 1857 is mostly known for Chief Justice Taney's conclusion that African Americans could never become citizens of the United States. But Taney also held that the property clause only applied in the 13 original states and thus, thus gave Congress no power to address slavery in the territories or at admitting new states. This faithful step closed off the last remaining hope of ending the practice of slavery peacefully through the political process and helped plunge the nation into civil war. Dred Scott's view of the property clause was unprecedented, without legal basis, and has never been followed. Indeed, the court's decision has been so discredited that Utah's hired lawyers do not even cite it, even though its state's right slant on the property clause is the most favorable precedent for its position. With that tragic slavery-related exception, the nation's public lands continued to play a crucial role in binding the nation together as it expanded to the Pacific and would soon come to play a role in healing the wounds of the Civil War. Now, a fourth myth is that the United States did not start retaining ownership of some public lands to serve national purposes until a century after the nation was founded. This is associated with the myths I've already mentioned. It's meant to suggest that for a long time there was no expectation that the national government would ever hold on to ownership of any lands. Again, the facts are to the contrary. Almost from the, from the beginning, Congress reserved public lands for broad public purposes. These included lands for military bases, for lighthouses, for Indian reservations. There were reservations of public land containing valuable minerals, salt springs, forests done in order to preserve public control of commodities vital to the nation. Public lands were occasionally reserved for broader purposes as well. In 1832, Congress retained and set apart some public lands in Arkansas containing hot springs as a health resort. During the same era, the United States also acquired from private owners lands for national purposes. In 1790, Congress authorized the purchase of what became the site of the military academy at West Point from private owners. And a few years later, started buying forested lands in the southeast to supply timber for building naval vessels. Now, these pre-Civil War reservations and acquisitions were not as large or as widespread as the ones that came later, but they illustrate how, from the very beginning, uh, Congress grasped the wisdom of keeping some lands in public ownership to serve important national objectives. And those objectives would, of course, naturally change over time as the nation expanded, its population grew, and its culture changed. In the first few decades after the Civil War, a powerful movement emerged for calling for holding more and larger tracts of land in national ownership. This movement had its roots in the war itself. Just as it changed much else about America, the Civil War helped move public land policy in a new direction with effects that you see today. 
It was no accident that the cohort of American politicians most directly involved in and deeply affected by that war would lead the way, using the public lands to help, in Abraham Lincoln's timeless words, bind up the nation's wounds. It began, it began modestly at a place in California called Yosemite. In 1864, President Lincoln signed into law a measure passed by a war-weary Congress that required the preservation of sizable tracts of public land for the sole purpose of making their inspirational qualities accessible to present and future generations. That legislation, sponsored by California Senator John Conness, an immigrant from Ireland, granted Yosemite Valley and a nearby tr grove of giant sequoia trees to the state of California, which had been admitted 14 years earlier, on the strict conditions cemented into federal law that they be protected forever in public ownership for general public enjoyment. Now, because so few people had ever visited, most Americans were introduced to um, Yosemite's magnificence by Carlton Watkins' photographs, uh, such as the one on the left. They had been displayed in a New York gallery immediately after an exhibit of Matthew Brady's shocking photographs of Civil War battlefield dead on the right. That juxtaposition suggested, as historian Simon Shama put it in his book, Landscape and Memory, that the Yosemite legislation was a redemption for the national agony wrought by that war. Protecting this iconic American landscape in public hands for contemplation and inspiration helped put the nation on a path to mending. Now, eight years later, in 1872, Congress took another momentous step, protecting two million acres of public land at a place called Yellowstone, north of here. That legislation, signed into law by Civil War hero Ulysses Grant, moved a step beyond the Yosemite model because it kept Yellowstone in national ownership in perpetuity. It was the world's first national park. Yellowstone also illustrated the capacity of the public lands to mend a battle-torn nation. Not long after the park was established, developers came forward with various schemes to carve it up, shrink its boundaries, build a railroad through it. This triggered a political struggle that went on for um, <clears throat> more than a decade. Two former enemies came together to lead the defense of the park. General Phil Sheridan, who's uh, <clears throat> uh, second from the left in the sitting down, uh, Civil War hero and commander of the Army of the West, and Missouri Senator George Vest somebody you've never heard of, but who served in the Congress of the Confederacy throughout the Civil War. He's on the far right, sitting, seated on the far right. Sheridan and Vest persuaded General, uh, President Chester A. Arthur in the middle, seated, uh, who in 1883 became the first sitting president to travel west to be inspired by the grandeur of the public lands to come to the park's defense. Eventually, the U.S. Army was deployed to defend it from looters. A few years later, the connection between public lands and national healing was again on display. In September 1890, same month, Congress began authorizing the purchase and preservation in U.S. ownership of the sites of such Civil War battles as Gettysburg, Antietam, and Shiloh. I think that's Shiloh on the right. And same time, created two new, large new national parks in California's Sierra Nevada Mountains, one encircling the Yosemite Valley and another further south at Sequoia on the left. Another key ingredient in this movement for public land preservation was patriotic pride in preserving and showing off the nation's magnificent, mostly wild scenery. What some have called scenic nationalism might be characterized as a kind of an unconscious absorption by Euro-Americans of Native Americans' deep identification with and respect for their surroundings. Also contributing was the idea popularized by the likes of Henry David Thoreau on the left and John Muir on the right, of the spiritual importance of connecting with the natural world. This movement was also fed by a deepening recognition, building on an influential book, Man and Nature, published in 1864 by a former congressman from Vermont, George Perkins Marsh, of the need to manage forested lands wisely in order to husband water and timber supplies, curb erosion, and to temper destructive flooding. These matters were especially important in the rugged and arid American West. As all this was brewing, there was a growing backlash across the country 
against industrial abuse of land, both private and public, by logging, mining, and railroad interests. At the height of the Gilded Age, where wealth was concentrated at the top and large corporations were subject to little regulation, mining was uncontrolled and forests across the country were being plundered by what late, later came to be called rape, run, and run methods. Hydraulic mining on the left, deforestation on the right. Hydraulic mining in the northern Sierra wreaked so much havoc upon downstream farmers and settlers that in the 1880s, the courts enjoined the practice as a public nuisance. This, in these environmental effects brought home the wisdom of Marsh's teachings to many Americans. Flooding exacerbated by unchecked logging and mining-related pollution rock damage elsewhere. <clears throat> Two men whose fortunes derived from the public lands personified this Gilded Age. One was William Stewart on the left, the so-called silver senator from Nevada. Wallace Stegner called him a figure to delight a caricaturist and depress a patriot. <laughs> Stewart grew wealthy litigating rights to the famous Comstock load in Nevada, went to the U.S. Senate in 1864, a millionaire, the richest member, before reaching his 40th birthday. Soon after arriving in the Senate, he wrote and engineered an enactment of the nation's first important law addressing mining on the federal lands and made it so complicated as to delight generations of lawyers to come. <laughs> Stewart lived large. He managed uh, to make and lose several fortunes in various ventures, most of them conducted while he was in public office. In 1873, he built a 19,000 square foot mansion on the left, known as Stewart's Castle on DuPont Circle in Washington, D.C. Soon thereafter, he left the Senate under a cloud for conspiring for a share of the profits to persuade some gullible Brits to invest in the failing Emma mine in the Little Cottonwood Canyon near here. After a 12-year hiatus, the Nevada legislature returned him to the Senate in 1887, where he served until 1905. Uh, he grudgingly accepted the idea that the national government might protect its land from what he called novelties, curiosities, and strange developments of nature as places of resort. But reserving the lands for public purposes like forest reserves, he said, was, quote, absurd, barbarous, outrage upon the West, and a disgrace to American civilization. Now, the second Gilded Age personage is on the right, William Clark, the Copper King, one of the wealthiest men in America. Mark Twain called him as rotten a human being as can be found anywhere under the flag. <laughs> as Montana prepared for the statehood in 1889, he bribed his way into the presidency of the state constitutional convention where he told the delegates that the city of Butte's poor air quality, a product of his company's mining activities, did not pose an obstacle to Butte becoming the new state capital. This was because he said, quote, all the, lay, all the town's physicians consider the smoke a disinfectant. And ladies in particular are very fond of the city's air because it has just enough arsenic to give them a beautiful complexion. <laughs> A few years later, he bought one of Montana's seats in the U.S. Senate, where he lectured his colleagues that Americans were, quote, obliged to avail ourselves of all natural resources at our command, and those who can come after can well take care of themselves. By the 1890s, though, the nation was turning sharply away from the silver senator and the copper king's message of un unrestrained greed <coughs> and scant regard for others, including uh, future generations or for the environment. In 1891, Congress approved what some consider the single most consequential piece of public lands legislation ever enacted, which came to be known as the Forest Reserve Act. It basically expanded long-standing congressional practice of delegating authority to the executive branch to keep and manage some public lands for public purposes by vesting in the president sweeping power to reserve vast tracts of those lands in permanent ownership to protect their values as watersheds. This measure culminated more than a decade of strenuous efforts inside the Congress and across the nation to keep much of the nation's remaining public lands not suitable for conventional farming from falling into the hands of large corporations. It resulted in dozens of forest reserves, which eventually became a system of national forests embracing 200 million acres, or about 8% of the nation's lands. Now, around the time the Forest Reserve legislation was being enacted, new voices were becoming influential. Scientific societies were organizing around things like forestry, archaeology, ethnology, paleontology, and other disciplines. And they were engaging and adding considerable momentum to this movement to reserve public lands. There was increasing public 
demand to protect wildlife and its habitat. Uh, by the way, it's Butte on the right. <coughs> um, wildlife and its habitat. Largely a reaction to the destruction of the American bison. That's bison skulls piled up in the middle picture. The passenger pigeon on the right. <coughs> and the plunder of millions of colorful birds uh, for fashion. This effort was led by sport hunters and by growing numbers of politically engaged women who were beginning to gain the right to vote, mostly in the Western states. In the Congress, the effort was spearheaded by John Lacey, Civil War veteran. That's him on the left and him in the Civil War uniform below. <clears throat> now, not long after armed conflicts between Indians and the United States came to an end, uh, Native Americans and their rich cultures were beginning to be appreciated rather than feared. And as this happened, interest deepened to protect cultural and archaeological resources found on many public lands. This led to the Landmark Antiquities Act of 1906, about which much has been heard lately, which authorized the president to reserve public lands containing features of, quote, historic or scientific interest as national monuments. It was also shepherded through Congress by John Lacey. It deepened the congressional practice of giving the executive broad authority to protect public lands in national ownership to serve values the public held dear. The powerful movement to protect significant amounts of land in U.S. ownership that was woven from all these strands, patriotism, science, nationalism, scenic nationalism, a backlash against the Gilded Age, growing interest in wildlife and cultural resources, played out in ways that explode two more myths about the public lands. One is that the movement was confined to the Western states, and the other that the effort was limited to lands the U.S. already owned. In both cases, the opposite is true. Starting around the turn of the 20th century, the movement found fertile ground across the entire nation. Theodore Roosevelt established forest reserves on public lands in Arkansas, Florida, Kansas, Oklahoma, even Puerto Rico. He established bird reservations on public lands in Louisiana, Michigan, Florida, as well as in the West. Congress quickly joined in, and the combined efforts eventually produced a large system of national wildlife refuges. One part of the Antiquities Act of 1906 broke new ground by authorizing the U.S. to accept donations of land to protect them permanently. This opened the door for private philanthropists and for states to make significant additions to the nation's bounty of protected places. Private philanthropists gave the U.S. Muir Woods in California and what eventually became Acadia National Park in Maine. These were the earliest examples, but many more followed, including at Jackson Hole, north of here. <clears throat> in 1911, Congress launched a major new program to establish forest reserves in the east, south, and midwest. This is Acadia on the left, and on the right is Congressman John Weeks of Massachusetts, the primary sponsor of what became known as the, as the Weeks Act. It was a counterpart to the Forest Reserve legislation Congress had enacted 20 years earlier. But it differed in two important ways. For one thing, it called on the U.S. to um, um, acquire na uh, private lands into national ownership, not simply reserve lands the U.S. already owned. Second, because a lot of that land had already been logged over, it was the first major land restoration legislation in American history. Over the next few decades, the Weeks Act resulted in the establishment of many new national forests, encompassing some 25 million acres in 25 states in the East, South, and Midwest. And over the same period, Congress authorized the acquisition of millions of acres of new national parks and wildlife reserves across the nation. This brings me to yet another myth, and maybe the most important one, about the public lands, namely that they were protected and held mostly over the opposition of local residents and state governments. This myth finds especially uh, fertile ground out here in the West. It make, makes for a nice storyline. Of course, the ruggedly independent West would fiercely oppose decisions by the national government to keep large tracts of Western lands under governmental control. There's one problem with it. It's mostly untrue. For one thing, the American West in the decades leading up to the 20th century was hardly as ruggedly independent as myth would have it. Euro-American uh, settlement was not characterized by individuals going off into the wild. Uh, there was a massive social effort to bring order to Western settlements. Political movements to give women the right to vote, uh, to prohibit the sale of alcohol, 
and to control guns, all pioneered in the West during this period. In the same era, far more Westerners were dying in industrial and mining accidents than, than in gunfights or Indian wars. By the 1890s, the West had a larger percentage of its population living in urban areas than any other region of the nation. Its growing cities and land developers were asking that the uplands that supplied them with water be protected. And so were rural settle settlers who wanted to safeguard water supplies for crop irrigation, a necessity in much of the arid West. It's also worth noting that by 1891, the West was also almost fully represented in Congress, but, but because by then only Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico were still territories. The other states had already been admitted and were represented. Nearly all of the forest reserves and other reservations of public lands in the West were popular right down to the grassroots. Of course there was occasional grumbling that the national government did not always make wise decisions in drawing reservation boundaries or consult enough with the locals. Some things never change, but the facts are beyond dispute and speak loudly. Far from being the result of a distant national government overpowering local opposition, these reservations mostly had the enthusiastic support of people in the affected regions. Indeed, practically all of the national parks, most of the forest reserves, and many of the national monuments came about as a result of petitions to the national government submitted by states and local residents and their political representatives. Several examples. The first forest reserve in Utah was established in the Wasatch Mountains, right above us, by President Grover Cleveland in 1897, the year after Utah became a state. Cleveland had the strong support of Utah's first governor, Heber Wells, Cleveland on the left, Heber Wells in the middle, who greased the skids for the president's action by withdrawing from sale and settlement state-owned lands in the Wasatch inside the proposed Federal Reserve. In the years that followed, other leading Utah politicians played similarly prominent roles in public land reservations, leading one historian to note that the national parks and forests established in the state had, quote, the hearty approval of most Utahns. Senator Reed Smoot on the right, who represented Utah in the U.S. Senate from 1903 to 1933, was an active supporter of Theodore Roosevelt's vigorous public land conservation initiatives. He backed John Muir's campaign to stop the Hetch Hetchy Dam in Yosemite National Park. He was a primary sponsor of legislation that established several national parks and the National Park Service itself. This history lends considerable irony to the fact that Utah today is the principal home for the movement to reduce protections for and to divest the U.S. of control of many public lands. Grassroots support for public land conservation reservations in this era can also be measured at the ballot box. Theodore Roosevelt was responsible for more public lands we see today than any other single individual in American history. He tripled the size of the national forest system, launched the national system of wildlife refuges, used the Antiquities Act 18 times <clears throat> to create more than a, uh, protect more than a million and a half acres. He could not and would not have done that without significant grassroots support. In 1904, when he was already well into that campaign, he carried every western state in the presidential election. This was a considerable improvement over his predecessor, William McKinley, who lost Nevada, Idaho, Montana, and Colorado in the 1900 election. Roosevelt carried every county in Colorado where forest reserves had been created, except one which he lost by 25 votes. Four years earlier, McKinley had lost all but one of those rural counties in Colorado. Now, at the instigation of a handful of Western senators, Congress eventually did take a few steps to um, curb Roosevelt's authority. Most notably in 1907, it limited his power to create new forest reserves in six specified Western states. Conspicuously, Utah was not among those six. Outside of those states, Roosevelt used his remaining time in office to create and expand many more forest reserves, setting aside millions and millions of more acres. And Congress continued to make its own reservations and authorized acquisitions of other land. In the end, Congress never made any serious attempt to rein in or overturn Roosevelt's legacy. The movement's grassroots popularity was also reflected in the Weeks Act of 1911, as I mentioned. It required the states to consent uh, to U.S. acquisition of lands inside 
uh, their borders. A number of states were so enthusiastic about this program that they enacted the necessary legislation before the Weeks Act was even sent to the president for signature. <clears throat> Illustrating once again how public lands provided a common ground to unite different interests, uh, Democratic governors from the North combined with Republican governors from the South. I'm sorry, backwards. <laughs> uh, Democratic governors from the South combined with Republican governors from the North uh, in support of the Weeks Act, leading the Massachusetts governor to tell a con congressional committee, only partly in jest, that this was the first time governors in the South and New England had ever appeared jointly before Congress to ask for something for the common welfare of the United States. In fact, state governments purchased many private lands in the 1920s and 1930s and then donated those lands to the national government for their protection. The statutory template that Congress used to protect major national parks in the East and South, places like Big Bend, upper left, Isle Royale, Michigan, lower left, Great Smokies, upper right, Everglades, lower right, as well as Mammoth Cave and several other places. Uh, they were acquired by the states from private owners and donated to the national government so they could become part of the national park system. Now one more myth has taken root. Holding and protecting public lands, according to this myth, has been inextricably bound up in partisan politics. It is true in recent years, protecting public lands is much more identified with the Democratic Party than its Republican counterpart. I'll come back to that at the end. But the historical record is clear that just as public land policy has tended to promote national unity, the movement to protect large tracts of land in national ownership has, for nearly all of the nation's history, been fundamentally nonpartisan or bipartisan. It's not an exaggeration to say that during this era when public land reservation and acquisition was most vigorously pursued, the proponents' party allegiance never played a significant role. Here's a few examples. The key congressional architects of the 1891 legislation which led to the creation of the National Forest System were a Republican congressman on the left, Lewis Payson of Illinois, and a Democratic congressman on the right, William Holdman of Indiana. Presidents Benjamin Harrison and, and William McKinley, both Republicans, and Grover Cleveland, a Democrat, each vigorously exercised that authority, establishing among them 50 million acres of forest reserves. The Republican legacy is especially prominent John Lacey, John Weeks, Utah's Governor Wells and Senator Smoot were, like Theodore Roosevelt, Republicans. In the 1920s, Republican Presidents Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover used the Antiquities Act to protect millions of acres of public lands. In places like Utah's Bryce Canyon, that was Harding, Glacier Bay, Alaska, Coolidge, who's on the left, <coughs> California's Death Valley and Colorado's Black Canyon of the Gunnison by Hoover on the right. Coolidge and Hoover also set in motion that campaign to create new national parks in the east, eastern part of the nation. President Eisenhower used the Antiquities Act to protect the C&O Canal in Washington, D.C., today the most popular recreational area in the capital region, two days before John F. Kennedy was inaugurated. How the last big chunk of public lands in the lower 48 was reserved from divestiture in the 1930s illustrates both the movement's support at the grassroots and its bipartisan nature. And because these reservations included a good deal of land in Utah, the episode is worth examining briefly. In 1929, President Hoover called for a systematic examination of the nation's remaining so-called public domain, which was the popular name for the mostly arid lands located primarily in the interior west that had not already been reserved in parks, forests, or other protected status. He suggested that the United States should retain those lands that had a distinctly national as opposed to local importance, but should transfer the other lands regarded as chiefly valuable for livestock grazing to the states. Republican Representative Don Colton of Utah sponsored the legislation that created the, the commission that Hoover called for. It, came, it became known as the Garfield Committee because its chair was former Interior Secretary James Garfield to study Hoover's suggestion. Colton explained his motivation on the House floor. He said the lack of supervision uh, and control of these nearly 200 million acres of public lands had led to overgrazing and severe erosion with the lands being ruined, he said, calling into question, quote, the future of the livestock industry in the West. 
A majority of the committee's 19 members were Westerners. Most were from the Intermountain West. The report of the committee issued in January 1931 endorsed Hoover's suggestion by calling on the U.S. to reserve additional lands that were important for forests, parks, monuments, and wildlife refuges, and then making those public lands deemed valuable chiefly for the production of forage to offer them to the states, and the states would have 10 years to decide whether to accept the responsibility. If a state did agree to take ownership of the land, the committee recommended, it would be impressed with a trust that required the land's rehabilitation and include such other restrictions as Congress might deem appropriate. If a state declined to act, declined the offer, the committee called for the lands to be retained in the U.S. ownership and managed in a fashion similar to the National Forest. The Garfield Committee also proposed that the U.S. retain mineral rights in any lands transferred to the states, but as President Hoover noted to the Western governors in suggesting this transfer ID in the first place, Federal re retention of mineral rights did not seriously impair uh, state interests because Congress is already effectively giving the states 90% of the U.S. mineral revenues under the terms of the Mineral Leasing Act passed in 1920. The Western states, led by Utah's Governor George Stern, spurned the committee's recommendation, and Congress never seriously considered it. And this opened the door. Uh, to uh, the establishment of the Taylor Grazing, enactment of the Taylor Grazing Act. It gave Congress, as one historian noted, an all clear signal to enact legislation that would for the first time control livestock grazing and hold these lands in, permanently in U.S. ownership. Utah Representative Colton, on the left, promptly introduced the bill to do just that, to restore the health of these lands. It passed House in 1932, but got no further, and then he was swept out in the Democratic tidal wave in that fall's election, and then Congressman Edward Taylor, a Democrat from Western Colorado who'd grown up in a cattle raising family, pushed the idea to enactment, and it's his name that's on the legislation. It became law in 1934. Passed the House overwhelmingly in the Senate on voice vote. Colorado Senator Alver, Alva Adams summed up Western sentiment this way, none of us likes to be regulated, and that's probably more true in Western areas than anywhere else, but regulation is preferable to overgrazing and lack of regulation that currently prevails on these lands. The act quickly led to a combination of executive and congressional action that kept about 150 million acres, most of the remaining un unreserved arid lands of the Intermountain West, including about 40% of Utah, in national ownership. This effectively ended large-scale divestitures of public lands outside the special case of Alaska. Interestingly, about the same time, the U.S. embarked on a parallel restoration program that involved reacquiring into national ownership failed Dust Bowl homesteads. This created a system of national grasslands that now exist across a dozen states in the western half of the nation. In the years that followed, the Garfield Committee's recommendation that deserving areas of remaining arid land should be put in national parks, monuments, refuges, and other status was implemented as appreciation grew of the marvelous scenic, archaeological, cultural, biological, and other values of these lands steadily grew. Congress and the executive together protected millions of these acres at places like Capitol Reef, Canyonlands, Great Basin, Joshua Tree, uh, Oregon Pipe Cactus, Mojave. Many more millions of acres were added to reserves that had been established earlier, places like Dinosaur National Monument, Grand Canyon, Grand Teton, Zion, Bryce Canyon, Saguaro, Death Valley, Great Sand Dunes, Wupatki, Craters of the Moon, Black Canyon of the Gunnison. Even more millions of acres have been protected as wilderness or wilderness study areas and by other kinds of legislation. Now, let me circle back to the first myth. I mentioned that the public lands have been a divisive force in American national life and suggest that there is one more myth, that for the last century and a quarter, the American people have sort of blown hot and cold on protected public lands. America has always had a minority of citizens who basically subscribe to libertarian principles, who, who dislike the basic idea of government owning and managing a lot of land, and indeed who are critical of almost anything the government does. This portion of the electorate has waxed and waned over time, influenced by things like general health of the economy. But the historical record is clear that for more than a century, a large majority of Americans, inside as well as outside the West, have strongly supported the national governments holding large amounts of land in common ownership for common purpose. 
The issue has simply not been a source of genuinely deep division in the nation's politics and culture. And the consistent results of public opinion polls taken over the last several years make clear that despite the noisiness of some critics, this remains true today. So, finally, what lessons can we draw about America's public lands from this clear-eyed look at their history? It seems to me hard to argue with the idea that the America's preservation of large amounts of land and national ownership has been extraordinarily visionary. Open to all, providing inspiration, education, and recreation to people from all walks of life across the nation, and indeed the world, they are a priceless legacy to hand down to succeeding generations. Perhaps the best example of governmental thinking for the long term that I know. Put another way, they're a huge political success story, a credit to the workings of our political system and our government, particularly our national government. This, it seems to me, is a particularly important lesson to draw today. We live in a sour, cynical era. Our political system is swamped with huge amounts of money, and politicians at all levels spend most of their time and energy seeking more of it. Not unrelated to this, a seemingly growing number of Americans routinely vilify the national government and politics. More than a few Americans find it easy to disregard the teachings of science and regard collective action of the most just, even of the most justifiable kind as a kind of threat to individual liberty. We seem to be struggling overall over the principles on which our country was founded. No one would argue that all public land management policies and decisions uh, have been wise. Our democratic system is controlled by humans, after all. We're as capable of being stupid and short-sighted as we are of being smart and visionary. No reasonable person would argue that every acre of public land ought to remain in national ownership, nor that the U.S. should never acquire another acre, nor that public land policies cannot be improved. We could re reconfigure ownership patterns by exchanges. We could block up ownership for more co coherent management. We could make some decision-making processes simpler and otherwise reform them to better serve the public interest. But the current political climate makes it practically impossible to make progress, even on measures that command support across the political spectrum. Now, perhaps one way to reduce the polarization is to keep the big picture in mind. We could honor the unifying role the public lands have played over the long sweep of the nation's history. We could celebrate the nonpartisan workings of our political system that has produced the results we see today. We could revere the inspired actions of many people, some known and many unknown, who have helped safeguard this vast public access, our common ground, as it were, allowing it to nurture national pride and a spirit of community in an increasingly diverse nation. In his 1971 environmental message, President Richard Nixon called the public lands, quote, the breathing space of the nation. Evidence has steadily emerged to support that idea that the public lands are good for mental as well as physical health. More than 80% of Americans now live in urban areas, a percentage that has doubled uh, since 1900. The West is now the most urban region in the country, has been for more than a century. More than 90% of the Westerners live in urban areas. Yet humans evolved in a biocentric world. Modern science is providing more and more confirmation of what the likes of uh, Aristotle and Wordsworth and Darwin and John Muir knew uh, that our brains respond favorably to encounters with the natural world. A spate of popular books makes this point. Books like The Nature Fix and Last Child in the Woods, uh, drawing attention to conditions like nature deficit disorder. America's public lands also offer valuable lessons to other nations. For well over a century, our policies have been emulated around the world, starting with the national parks, sometimes called the best idea America ever had. The U.S. was also a pioneer in using public lands to protect wildlife habitat on a large scale, with a sizable portion of the world's species now threatened with extinction. The eminent biologist Edward O. Wilson recently advocated in that book, setting aside about half the, planet, uh, the planet's surface as a protected natural reserve. In the U.S., our protected public lands put us well on our way to that goal. These public lands are also good for our economy, local and regional as well as national. One contribution is obviously direct through travel and tourism, the outdoor recreation area, 
is bec uh, <coughs> industry is becoming one of the nation's uh, largest and most job intensive economic sectors. Public lands also enhance the quality of life in nearby communities, and that attracts retiring baby boomers who have significant non-labor income and businesses who tout access to them as a talent recruiting and retention tool. <clears throat> the public lands are also, I would argue, one of the world's great bargains. By almost every measure, one of the most cost-effective things the U.S. government does. The total annual budget for the four principal federal land management agencies that manage this 600 million acres is $13 billion. That's a, a tiny fraction uh, <coughs> of the um, total discretionary federal uh, budget. And that budget number, $13 billion, by the way, does not reflect offsetting billions of dollars of oil and gas and other revenues produced every year. And it funds many things besides stewardship and visitor services and science, such as fighting wildfires. Fires. <clears throat> it's a drop in the bucket, less than one-third of one percent of the total uh, $3.8 trillion federal budget. And the four land management agencies employ about three percent of the U.S. government's total civilian uh, workforce. So, while there's much to celebrate and treasure about the public lands, uh, let me close with a warning. Some of my libertarian friends uh, tend to call the public lands political lands. They, they use the term scornfully. Uh, but they're exactly right. The public lands remain a creature of politics and our political system. This means their future is not guaranteed. <clears throat> While the national government has, uh, so far, generally safeguarded public lands for future generations, they can be eliminated. Let's not kid ourselves. Ownership can be transferred to the states or the private sector. No public land, not even Yellowstone, not even Yosemite, not Zion, is immune. All it takes is a simple act of Congress. Congress could do it tomorrow. Even if Congress does not act, existing law gives the executive branch considerable authority to transfer effective control over these lands, many of these lands, to states or the private sector through leases or other long-term legal arrangements. What it boils down to is this. Each new generation of Americans must decide effectively what it wants to do with these lands. Without political support, they and the values they bring us can be lost. Now, do we have cause for concern? On the one hand, as I mentioned, just about every public opinion poll almost everywhere shows strong continuing popular support for protecting the public lands. But there are reasons not to be complacent. Years of fierce rhetoric employed in an unrelenting campaign funded by deep-pocketed interests has demonized and undermined government and science in the eyes of a significant portion of Americans. This makes the public lands a prominent symbol of government, particularly in the West, a target. One result of this has been the withdrawal of official Republican Party support for holding and protecting public lands. In a stark departure from the long history of Republican championing of public land conservation, beginning in the 1990s, the party began officially endorse, endorsing a program to divest some public lands to the states or private sector. The 2016 party platform called on Congress to, quote, immediately pass universal legislation providing for a timely and orderly mechanism requiring the federal government to convey certain federal, federally controlled public lands to states. And it called upon all national leaders and state leaders to use their utmost power and influence to urge the transfer of these lands. Now, so far that idea has gained no political traction, but a number of leaders in Washington are currently working to shift as much control over public lands as possible to state and local governments and the private sector. It is telling that this is happening at the same time that some wealthy owners of large tracts of private lands in the West are closing traditional access not only to their lands but to adjacent public lands as well. All of this has led some to suggest that America is in a new gilded age where comparisons might be drawn between current figures and figures like Senators Stewart and Clark. Another storm cloud is that the administration and allies in Congress are proposing severe cuts in federal land management regulatory agency budgets. President Trump's 2018 budget would have reduced funds for the National Park Service by 13%, the largest reduction proposed since the end of the Second World War. <clears throat> Such reductions could not come at a, at a worse time. Recreational visits to public lands are skyrocketing. The National Park Service set attendance records in the last three years. 
1980, there were 2 million visitors to the Grand Canyon. In 2011, it was 4 million. Last year, it was over 6 million for the first time. Similar trends are found at public lands in Utah and around the country. Challenges posed by climate change makes the jobs of the federal land management agencies even more difficult. A big increase in the number and intensity of wildfires is the only visible indicator. And fighting these fires is a major drain on agency resources. Slashing agency budgets when public lands are being overwhelmed by visitors and other challenges inevitably makes it harder for these agencies to fulfill their stewardship mission of protecting these lands and keeping them accessible for public use. Closing field offices, shrinking agency workforces, distances the agencies from the general public. Over, the, over time, this will inevitably sap public confidence and federal management, and with it, public support for public lands. Sadly, a, a good case can be made that such a downward spiral is exactly what advocates of such budget cutting intend, to cause government to falter and lose the confidence of the public. Finally, it's a reason for concern that we all, especially younger Americans, may grow so addicted to our devices and to the virtual reality that our gadgets offer us to pay much attention to or learn to cherish the marvelous resources found on the public lands. Only time will tell whether the movement to divest the U.S. of ownership and or control of the public lands will succeed or whether America will continue to embrace their public lands. I hope the embrace will continue. Not long ago, the New York Times ran an article describing how some military combat veterans had found that distance hiking on the public lands helped restore their psychological health. They were discovering something that John Muir wrote about as the 19th century was drawing to a close. People are beginning to find out that going to the mountains is going home, Muir wrote, that wildness is a necessity, that parks and reservations are useful, not only as fountains of timber and irrigating rivers, but as fountains of life. Thank you for listening. We have time for questions. But we do have time for. We do have time for a few questions. I realize a few folks uh, have time constraints. Uh, but uh, as noted on the board here, it's uh, possible to, uh, through your devices, uh, to send questions down here, and we've uh, received some during the course of your talk, John. No right. surprise <laughs> here. Uh, let me start with uh, one, and you also, incidentally, you can uh, like uh, questions, uh, which puts them sort of up toward the top of the queue. So in this time of national and local uh, here in Utah, uh, backlash against conservation of public lands, uh, what do you think are the most important things to advocate for and educate about to avoid uh, permanent and irreversible damage to the public lands? Um, well, as I, I said, the, you know, these are political lands, and that means the political system runs them, and we make decisions through our political system. So. If you love and care about the public lands, then you need to engage in the political system and make your voices heard. It's really, it's really that simple. It's, as I said, there's nothing perfect about this system that we have, and it can be improved. The, the problem is the polarization that is now present essentially paralyzes the system so we can make no decisions uh, at all uh, to improve or not. And so I think that people who care about the public lands need to politically engage. It's really that simple. So an, another question, and there's uh, variations of this. It comes as no surprise, uh, given your legal background and uh, involvement uh, through the Clinton administration in the establishment of uh, the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, what are your uh, thoughts on the possible outcome of uh, uh, the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase uh, litigation? Well, I used to be a litigator. I know enough never to predict the outcome of litigation. I, I will say that, you know, there are very credible arguments on both sides. Um, it is not, it's not a slam dunk uh, either way. Um, to sort of summarize, boil down the legal arguments to their essence, uh, normally when the president is invested with power to do something, there's kind of a general understanding that the president has implied power to undo it. Uh, you know, that one president can't bind another kind of thing. And that's sort of a, a general understanding. On the other hand, the Antiquities Act is very interesting because it's 
gives the president the power to protect. It does not give the president the power to unprotect. And other laws that were enacted around that same time, like the 1891 Forest Reserve Act, specifically said the president may create forest reserves and may modify or uncreate them. Uh, so, as I said, both sides have credible arguments. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens. I won't predict the outcome. Could you uh, comment on uh, why uh, Utah seems to be uh, leading the charge uh, for trying to get control of uh, federal lands? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I don't live here. I don't. Um, um, I will say, as I said in my talk, it's astonishing to me if you look at history um, how the people of Utah 100 years ago welcomed these initiatives and now seems to be, you know, turning the back on them. And that's, that's mystifying to me. I don't have an answer why, but I would hope people would look back to their history and, and try to deepen their understanding of it. In retrospect, uh, are there safeguards uh, that could have been used to avoid uh, some of the downsizing uh, that we've seen recently uh, in, in government and in management of the public lands? Oh, and I don't know. You know. These are deep sort of cultural, political changes that are, um, uh, you know, a long time coming and frankly will probably be a long time to, to change. So I don't, I don't think there's any, there was no magic bullet to stop this from happening that I know of. Back to the Utah National Monuments. Uh, uh, they are the subject of several lawsuits. Uh, in the interim, uh, are the lands within their boundaries uh, protected from abuse? Uh, that's a very interesting and very complicated question. And uh, you know, the, the litigators who are challenging the Trump actions, for example, yeah, they have to make a difficult strategic decision about, well, do we try to enjoin the president from sort of putting this into effect? That turns out to be a really complicated question. Most of the sort of bad, from the standpoint of protecting these places, things that could happen, require a governmental process. So yes, the areas that the President Trump excised from Grand Staircase or uh, Bears Ears can be leased for oil and gas or coal and, and other things, but those require processes, and, and that's, a, that's a complicated step-by-step -step process. And, there, there's nothing to enjoin right now. I mean, the, the threat comes when the leases are issued. Well, that's going to be years down the road with respect to most things. There are things that can happen in the interim, but, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, it, it was illegal to vandalize things before Bears Ears was created when it was just ordinary public land. It is still illegal to do that. The creation of the monument brings a visibility and, and a sort of resources, enforcement resources and the like to these areas that, that is now missing. So these areas are vulnerable, but you know, it's like the terrible things going to happen tomorrow. Uh, no. And related to that, and uh, you touched on this, but maybe you could uh, elaborate a little more. Is there any sort of uh, precedent, uh, uh, even tangential, for undoing a monument designation? <clears throat> also a good question. <clears throat> Um, no president has ever rescinded an earlier president's monument proclamation. Never been done. Congress rescinded a handful of presidential monuments. Uh, tiny ones you never heard of and nobody cared about. The big ones have all stayed and, and been protected. There are two examples. Uh, let me back up. Many presidents have expanded monuments created by earlier presidents. That's a, that's a rich history. And Congress has actually converted many of those monuments into national parks. So the trend is very much toward sort of more protection of more acreage. However, there are two examples in history where presidents did shrink uh, earlier presidents' monuments. Uh, in World War I, President Wilson uh, cut out uh, several hundred thousand acres out of the Mount Olympus National Monument that Theodore Roosevelt created. And in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt uh, cut off, I don't know, 70,000 or so acres of land that uh, Roosevelt Theodore Roosevelt had put in the Grand Canyon uh, National Monument. Um, neither one of those was ever litigated. So we don't have any court guidance on whether this is, was lawful or not. And in fact, in both cases, Congress and the presidents later added the lands back in. So they didn't remain permanently uh, shrunk. But 
So we have a couple of examples in practice of shrinking, but no judicial test of the legality of that. And that also makes this current litigation pretty interesting. Would you recommend uh, any particular changes in the uh, Bureau of Land Management to increase uh, local buy-in uh, for the uh, Utah National Monuments? Um, well, it's a complicated uh, question. The, um, the, the BLM, uh, in my judgment, has come a long way in the last few decades in terms of involving the pub general public and the users of public lands more and more, and it's been a, generally a pretty positive development. Um, you know, there has been, there, there, with the exception of the Grand Staircase, which had a, you could say, very abbreviated kind of consultation period of a couple of weeks back in 1996, uh, most presidents and administrations that have created monuments have done a, a consultation process that has involved local uh, agencies. And uh, uh, I think that President Obama and his people did that uh, before Bears is uh, originally. So I, I'm not sure there's a process problem there, but maybe the courts will weigh in on that. And a historical question, uh, based on past uh, federal land acquisitions that you highlighted during your uh, uh, with, with your slides on uh, Western expansion. Uh, why do the Western states like Utah and Nevada uh, have such large tracts of public lands, uh, while others uh, like Iowa uh, and in the Midwest uh, have uh, none or very few? Um, topography, climate, uh, history, uh, history of settlement uh, patterns and the like. Um, you know, uh, I mean, think back, um, People didn't anticipate that Las Vegas was going to be what it was today. You know, when the Colorado River Compact was negotiated in 1922, uh, uh, Nevada got a very tiny slice of the water of the Colorado River because everybody thought it would permanently, you know, be tiny. Well, that sort of turned out to be wrong, but uh, air conditioning had a lot to do with it. I lived in, in uh, Arizona for years, and uh, the old timers in Phoenix, it used to make me laugh, the old timers in Phoenix would... Uh, divide the history of the world into two epochs, before air conditioning and after air conditioning. And when air conditioning came along in the 1940s, Phoenix had, I don't know, 50,000 people in 1945. It's got, what, 3 million today? Uh, that has something to do with it. Um, let's see. Uh, if, if you had uh, one message to communicate uh, the support for protection of Utah's public lands, uh, what would it be? Get engaged. Um, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to your re elected representatives, and uh, uh, if you care about this stuff, you have to speak up. Like I said, every generation has to decide, right? I mean, people 15 years old today, uh, are going to be sort of calling the tune about the public lands in, in 20 or 30 years uh, and their cohorts. So uh, I think continued political engagement in the, how these lands are uh, managed and kept uh, is essential if uh, they are to remain. And uh, we'll wrap it up with one uh, final question. Uh, how can we make public lands more accessible and valuable to uh, underprivileged uh, communities that have historically been shut out from enjoying them uh, for economic and cultural reasons? Um, it takes a lot of work, and I think the, the government has been doing more and more in that direction, a, a very good thing. I mean, uh, Sally Jewell did a... Uh, Sort of a pro, uh, what, a every kid in the park kind of program, uh, you know, giving uh, families with small children free passes to the park for a year, that sort of thing. Uh, putting um, uh, uh, public lands closer to the people. Um, uh, President Obama did a national monument in the San Gabriel's in Los Angeles. It's uh, just north of the Altadena, Pasadena area. Uh, that area, uh, and as part of doing that, made a big effort to get more. Uh, uh, particularly from Latino communities in the urban areas nearby, uh, opening up programs for, for them. It, it takes a lot of work, but it has to be done, again, because these are the people who are going to decide uh, what the future of these lands are going to be, and if they don't engage, uh, they're going to be lost. John, thank you very much. Thank you.
What a great way to kick off the 23rd Annual Wallace Stegner Center uh, Symposium, Public Lands in a Changing West. Uh, we'll build upon that over the next two days. Please join us uh, starting tomorrow morning. I believe 8.30 is when we start. Uh, and we'll be right here. Uh, brochures are available outside if you haven't registered already, and we look forward uh, to seeing you. Uh, join me again in thanking John for this very thoughtful. Thank you.